For, extent, for example, in WCG, we have four main virtual organizations, one for each big LHC experiments. So the VO role here is to group together people working in the experiment that need access to the computing infrastructure. So the VO is basically the integration point between the users the, and the resource providers. Uh, the sites provide computing and storage resources to the VO as a black box. Then it's up to the virtual organization to choose how to best organize access to these computing and storage resources. And to do this, the VO typically organizes users in groups uh, that grant uh, different access privileges on the, on the computing infrastructure. So in order to support the VO model, the, 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 the WCG AI basically needs to define uh, how users should be authenticated, how users are registered in a VO, and how the membership life cycle is managed. So for how long a, member, a user should be part of the VO, what happens when the, when the user leaves the VO, and all these aspects, how user privileges are managed. So how can administrator grant um, specific users specific um, particular privileges? How can the user be organized in groups and grant other attributes? And, and especially how authentication and information and authorization information is exposed to services uh, so that uh, authentication authorization can, can be implemented correctly. Then we have the, the infrastructure perspective. So the point of view of the sites who provide the resources and the services, their computing and storage services, not to a single VO, but to many VOs. So for the infrastructure, point of view, it's very important to know the identity behind any computational activity running on their sites. So basically, they need to know um, the identity, the authentication attributes, the authorization attributes for each job running on their site in order to implement authorization so that uh, proper access control is enforced to implement accounting and also logging and OTT that are important for traceability. Also sites typically needs flexible tools to contain security incidents and to block misbehaving computing activities. Like for example, when a, a single misbehaving job from a, from a user is consuming all the VO resources at the site. The sites ideally would want uh, a tool that would allow to block that single user and not the whole VO activity at that site. And finally, we have the user's perspective. Uh, users typically are not very worried about the AI. Actually, what they would want is not to be bothered at all with AI. Scientists want to do their science. But if we look at from a very high level point of view at what the users want is basically a simple way to log in into the, the system and access multiple services in a, in a computing session without having to pipe passwords uh, 10 times or, uh, or uh, or other complex procedures. So basically they want a single sign-on solution. They want to, the ability to delegate their rights to agents that act on their behalf while they are offline. This can happen because actually scientific computation can take a uh, very long time to complete. And they want also the ability to choose from a very high level under which role they want to act in a computing session. So whether they are hacking as a, an unprivileged user or as an administrator. So all these requirements uh, led to the definition of the current WCG AI, which is in operation since 2003 and still working nicely. This slide, which uh, actually picks a slide from uh, a presentation from the European Data Grid project from 2002, still does a good job, this old slide, still does a good job in describing the main components of the WCG AI, which I will not describe in detail today, but it is here for reference. One thing that I want to underline, though, is that the main limitation of the WCG AI as it is today is that it's centered and tightly bound to experimental certificate, so to a single authentication mechanism. This is a problem uh, for usability since scientists uh, aid to manage uh, experimental certificates, but also complicates the integration of the experiment frameworks with uh, resources that are uh, provided, for instance, by public cloud providers. So uh, in order to work around these limitations, in recent years, uh, uh, we started working on the evolution of the AI beyond experiment towards an AI that is not bound to any specific authentication mechanism, and it can easily 
integrate and uh, securely all the resources that are needed to support the, the current and the future LXC computing requirements. In these slides, I, I include some pointers to a detailed description of these activities. I, I will not go into any detail here. This is just a, a very brief introduction. The point that I want to underline, however, is that this noble WCG AI, which is centered on the Indigo IM technology, is basically building upon uh, technology that is provided by the EOSCA. And uh, the, the, a common trait of, uh, of the technology and of the EOSCA AI that we, we will describe today is that uh, um, the technology that we will describe typically support multiple authentication mechanisms, so are not bound to any specific authentication, are flexible in this sense, and can um, classify the authentication mechanism depending on their level of assurance. Um, the technology that we uh, describe provide uh, users with persistent geoscoped identifier, which are important to implement auditing and uh, traceability for the, the activities for the users. Uh, the technology that are part of the ESCAB AI typically uh, build upon open standards. So in the case of uh, the WCG AI, uh, the approach uh, is to focus on uh, JSON web tokens and uh, auth and open ID connect protocols. This approach is, uh, uh, was chosen because basically this will allow us to uh, reuse as much as possible uh, components from the industry so we don't have to develop our own solution to, 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 to migrate into this new AI. And more importantly, a uh, thing that I want to underline that was particularly important for WCG is that this new AI that we are developing is meant to be backward compatible with the existing infrastructure. We don't want to, the infrastructure to stop working because we are migrating the AI. Basically, we are designing something that can be backward compatible so that we can migrate gradually and likely this migration will take here. All these concepts that uh, are brief, very briefly in, in, uh, introduced uh, here are defined in the, this uh, document that is the ARC, the Blueprint Architecture for which the, the AI uh, that uh, uh, WCG is migrating to is compliant. And, um, and this transition that we are doing is happening now. So basically you can see here a screenshot for, uh, for the, the first uh, deployment of the, the CMS IAM instance in support of the CMS experiment, which is uh, one of the uh, big LSC experiments that will use this infrastructure. So this was uh, a very uh, high level introduction to describe what a real world community AI is. So it's not just a, a, an abstract concept, it's actually a set of uh, uh, people, a set of technologies and a set of uh, rules that, that uh, ensure that a uh, uh, computing uh, infrastructure can be accessed securely and reliably. And uh, <clears throat> this technology that we are using is part of the USCAB AI portfolio. And uh, the same approach that we, that we are following could be interested and adopted also by other communities. So this basically concludes my very uh, quick introduction. So now I pass the baton to Nicholas, I think, for a more general introduction on what the USCAB AI is in more detail. Thanks. Thank you for this really useful. So, uh, after this real world example, let's see how the EOSCAB AI works. Next slide, please. So, first of all, uh, this is an overview of the main features that are supported. Some of these have already been mentioned by, by Andrea. So, there is support for different authentication providers. There is the option for researchers to use the institution credentials for Medigain. They can use external providers, the social media, ORCID other identity providers that are managed by, by community. And this, of course, federated uh, uh, access minimizes the number of accounts that researchers have to manage and it reduces the complexity and the security risks. Uh, there is support for both web and non-web uh, uh, services uh, based on, on, uh, on standards. So SAML, OpenID Connect, OAuth 2, X509, uh, there is support for researchers to link different identities. So it is possible for a researcher to, to link their institutional and their social identity. Uh, access is managed based on attributes such as uh, user membership, roles, affiliation, 
or capabilities. Some of this information is provided by the researchers' uh, home organization. Uh, other parts of the authorization are, are matched by the, the, by the community. Next slide, please. Uh, and another key feature is uh, the interoperability uh, supported by the Eskab AI, uh, again, uh, based on the standards that, is, uh, that have been adopted, OpenID Connect, SAML, OS2, and so forth. Uh, in, the, in, the uh, in, the, in the policy area, we have uh, uh, an architecture that supports the minimal disclosure principle. Uh, there are security frameworks that ensure good practices in operational security. Uh, there is also a, a security framework for the, the coordination of instance in a federated way because in this uh, uh, complex uh, system that there are a lot of entities that are involved. So there is the user's home organization, there is the, the community AI, there are the service providers. So a, a, a federated instant response uh, framework is of uh, key importance to support this scenario. And lastly, uh, there, is, uh, there, there are standards for expressing the assurance. Effectively, this translates to how much a line party can trust uh, the attributes of the user. Next slide, please. Now, uh, you've already heard the, the, uh, the ARC Blueprint architecture, which is the, the, uh, the, the reference architecture upon which the Airscape AI builds. Uh, in this architecture that you can see on the right side, so this is the, the latest version of the Apple Blueprint architecture, version 2019. Uh, there is at the top the user identity layer that brings together the different authentication providers that we discussed before. Um, at, the, at the center, there is the access protocol translation layer, which uh, comprises the discovery service uh, that needs to uh, provide all the different authentication providers uh, options in a user-friendly way. Uh, there is the proxy that serves as the bridge between the identity providers and the end services. And then there is the, uh, uh, the token translation services uh, for, for services that require the translation of, of tokens. Uh, as you can see at the end services layer, uh, there is uh, support for SAML, X509, OpenID Connect, OAuth2. And then there is the, this blue vertical layer here, which is uh, uh, mostly of interest for communities because this is where all the, co or the, co the, the community profile of the user is being managed. And then there is the green layer, the authorization, which is responsible for mediating access uh, based on the information from the community attribute services layer. Next slide, please. Now, in, in, in the EOSCAB AI architecture, we can distinguish between two different layers. So there is the community layer, uh, which uh, contains all the different community AI services and enables the, the, the use of the community identities for access and resources. And then there is the infrastructure uh, layer, uh, which enables access to, to, to the resources, again, through these uh, proxy services that bridge the different community AI services with the infrastructure uh, services. Next slide. Uh, so what do we achieve with the community layer? Uh, we allow researchers to register just once with their community AI. And then a researcher can always use their community AI to sign in and be able to access uh, community services, this cloud over here, this uh, includes all the services that are offered to a given community. Uh, there is also uh, uh, access to generic services. So this means services that are offered to uh, multiple communities. And then there are the uh, EOSC services offered by different research and, and infrastructures that are made available through these uh, infrastructure uh, proxies. Next slide, please. So we have the, the research infrastructure proxy, the research or infrastructure proxy that acts as a single integration point for services. Uh, this means that services don't need to uh, have their identity provided discovery service because as we mentioned, there are a lot of authentication providers, so it's not straightforward how to do uh, the identity provider uh, discovery 
in a user-friendly way. So this uh, can be uh, uh, handled by the infrastructure proxy or the community AI. And again, the, this uh, uh, infrastructure proxies allow services to get the information about the user, including authentication, authentication of, uh, information in a uniform way, because uh, we have different uh, uh, identity providers, different protocols, but through these, uh, these proxies, uh, the, the, other, the other are harmonized, so the services don't need to deal with the differences between the different uh, protocols. Next slide, please. Now, this, in, this, uh, uh, this is the same, the, the same uh, architecture, but a slightly different view that's closer to how it is actually this, uh, is deployed. So as you can see with this uh, architecture, uh, communities can uh, enable different authentication options. For example, this purple uh, community AI here uh, enables institutional logins from EduGame while the, the orange one also supports uh, social uh, login options, ORCID, etc. Uh, again, a community might choose to, to, to uh, enable access to specific infrastructures. So this purple community, for example, uh, enables access to both uh, of these infrastructure uh, proxies and the services behind them, while the orange one uh, only supports one of the uh, available uh, infrastructure proxies. So uh, the, 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 the whole concept behind this uh, uh, architecture is to make the service providers life easier by providing them a single point of integration. Next slide, please. So how can communities make use of, of, the, of the EOS Hub AI? There are two main use cases. So, Communities typically want to connect, to, to consume uh, EOS service resources. And there is the other scenario where communities are interested in sharing their services and resources through EOS. If you go to the next slide, please. So for the first use case, when a community needs to consume EOS service and resources, if, if the community already has, uh, already manages a, a, an RBPA compliant community AI, then uh, what is needed is for that community to connect uh, its community, its existing community AI uh, service to the infrastructures where they need to, to, uh, to consume services from. Now, uh, in, in the next slide, if, what, what happens if the community doesn't have its own community AI? Then there is the option uh, to use one of the different uh, multi-tenant AI service offerings that are already available through EOS Hub. If you go to the next slide, you can see that uh, there are different community, multi-tenant community AI services that can serve different uh, communities and VOs. So there is B2Access, uh, there is Check-in, uh, there is uh, EduTeams, there is EAM. Next slide. Now let's go to the other use case, a community that uh, wants to offer the services through EOS. Well, again, we have uh, two sub use cases. So, if the if if the the community already has an RPPA compliant infrastructure proxy mediating access to these services, then offering the infrastructure the research infrastructure resources uh, through EOS means uh, connecting their their uh, infrastructure proxy to the infrastructure proxy layer of the Airscape AI, and then of course, connecting it to the communities, that they, the community AIs that they want to, to serve. Now, uh, for the other use case, if a, a, a community has some services uh, that are not behind the proxy, then they can connect their services to one of the infrastructure proxy services that are already available uh, in EOS Hub. So for this part of the presentation, uh, Jens is going to uh, provide a, a summary of the policy related uh, requirements for communities. So I'll give the floor to, to Jens. Thank you, Nicholas. Next slide, please. So we've talked a lot about communities. So 
uh, maybe it's worth just um, reminding ourselves, we actually had the definition on an earlier slide. The definition of a community is a group of subjects having a common or at least similar activities goals. So what's the difference between a community and a virtual organization and, and how might they um, how might they be related to each other? So a community will typically organize itself around the activities and forming a virtual organization is, is one of the things that it might do in order to make use of an infrastructure. So a good example perhaps is Clarin, which is a linguistics community, which um, has a, a lot of diverse activities. So for some activities, for some interactions with infrastructures, it might make sense for Clarin to present it, itself as a single VO and just say, oh, well, we do all kinds of linguistics research. And for some of the specialized topics that are the specialized activities that are happening within Clarin, it may make sense to set up smaller VOs that are more specialized. It, it all depends on, there's no right solution. It all depends on how to best interact with the, or the infrastructures. However, of course, if the infrastructures are interoperating, then it makes sense to have just a single VO that, that faces the infrastructures. So um, perhaps there's a recommendation to have as few VOs as possible, particularly because uh, traditionally, it is non-trivial to set up a new VO in terms of the, the kind of amount of work that needs to be done in registrations. Next slide, please. So a community needs obviously to have its goal and policies defined. Uh, what are we going to do and why are we doing it and how are we doing it and who can be a member of the community? And um, this is all just to get the community to think about what its activities are. Uh, we sometimes speak to user groups who haven't really thought about it carefully enough. And they say, can we start using your infrastructure and get some resources, please? And, and we go to them and say, yes, what would, you, what would you actually like to do? Also, we require that they define acceptable use. Uh, so we know precisely what they're going to do on the infrastructure. And ideally that should be compatible with the use of with the infrastructure's acceptable use policy as well. So uh, a community might wish to pin it down a bit more uh, to say that, well, yes, we are doing linguistics research and anything, um, anything else would be inappropriate use of resources. We also require that communities take responsibilities for having users accept the AUP and to ensure that they uh, confirm that they accept the policy. So if they use the proxy that Nicholas talked about, the community proxy and come through, then we want them to have already accepted the community's AUP. So we can just, as an infrastructure, as a service provider, we can treat the community as a whole through the, the proxy and we don't have to deal with individual users. Also relevant, obviously, is data protection because they have personal data when they um, because they need to run the community, they need to manage attributes and stuff. They also need to participate in, in incident response. If there's a problem that involves a member of the community, like uh, inappropriate use or, or something, then we require them to participate in the, in the resolution of this incident. Also, if they make any changes to their acceptable use policy or membership policies or anything, they should inform the infrastructure. And finally, if they run their own services like IDPs and things, then obviously they must maintain those in a responsible way. Next page, please. So finally, the membership workflow is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, so depending on how the infrastructure manages community memberships, so the community um, IDP, how they manage memberships, you either find the community and apply for membership or you get invited and somebody in the community, typically a delegated person, will approve that or reject it. And if they reject it, ideally, they should give a reason for rejection. And then you go on to the full membership where they might assign roles and, and responsibilities to you. They might give you the role to um, review other applications for membership or, or some such. Then regularly, there's a renewal process where 
where people are required to say, yes, I still want to be a member of that community. This is just to, um, as an extra safeguard, if people leave the organization or do, do something else that they, um, uh, that there's a, a check maybe once a year, that they're still happy to be members of the organization uh, and they're still happy to uh, accept the acceptable use policy. And then they, they can get removed from the community or they can get banned. Typically, um, it is the infrastructure that bans users from on misuse, like Andrea mentioned earlier in this talk. But uh, in, in principle, a community could also ban a user for misuse. Next slide, please. And with this, I hand over to Nicholas and or Christos for the next part. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. So for, for, uh, for in this part of the presentation, we're going to discuss how communities can manage access to, to the resources. So we'd like to give the floor to, to, to Christos now. Hello. Uh, so we shared a lot of, of, of uh, background information about how you can manage a VO, what should we do, flows, potential flows to, um, to ban users, to uh, include users. In the next couple of slides, we try to put some very high level um, uh, visualization of how we see things working in the context of, of VOs. Of course, many details are, are, are not there, but we would like to take one step back at this point and give you the high level view of how we see people interacting with VOs. Basically, it should all start with um, a community that wants to actually use uh, uh, resources from uh, the European Open Science Cloud. So the uh, a representative of the community, probably a, a man the manager of this community will go to a community A service and uh, the user will register on, on that um, community A service and request the creation of, of a virtual organization for, for, for his or her community. Uh, next slide, please. So when the visual organization is created, uh, the VO manager now will be able to invite members and uh, there will be probably sent email invitations. There are multiple ways of, of, of someone that can invite members depending also on the tools that um, will be used. And then they will be able to actually manage the visual organization, create groups, assign roles to these, to these users. So suddenly there is a structure on this VO that possibly represents how, how the collaboration actually works. Uh, next slide, please. So now we have uh, a team of people. It could be 10 people, it could be thousands of people grouped within a within visual organization. The, the next step, and of course this doesn't have to be sequential, but in, in this uh, slide I could take it out as a sequential order, you need to add services. I mean, there's no point to have this organization without actually having services. The whole purpose that we create all these AI structures that, so that users, communities, collaborations could be able to share access to services and share resources and in, in a secure manner. So um, the typical thing is, is to start adding their own community-based services, uh, go through the steps in a more or less automated manner, add metadata for some services, connect open and connect services, enable the services. Next slide, please. So at this point, basically we have a visual organization, a number of users, a number of services connected to that, to, to that uh, visual organization and users can start to collaborate and access those services. But as we have been discussing, um, there is uh, the case that many communities would like to use also resources offered by other resource providers, not resource providers that are strictly within their community. So next slide, please. So the way that we see things is that basically, again, a community representative should be able to go to the EOS marketplace, find services that would be of interest to the community, request access for these services, and enable the services for the community. So, uh, next slide, please. When this, is, when this is done, effectively, the VO has expanded its uh, access to services. And now you have your own uh, community services connected to VO, but also services provided by, by other resource providers. And those services might be the case that they're sitting behind other infrastructure proxies. Now, this is where basically what we want to see happening is that this whole 
linking of services should be more or less automatic. The moment basically community is authorized to use a service from a resource provider, the whole technical integration should be outside of the site of, of the community itself. It should happen more or less in an automatic manner. In the same way, like what Jens was describing, was that uh, the user, the users, when they become members of the community, they have to accept some policies, terms of use. All this information has to flow transparently from the community service to the end services, regardless if they are directly connected to the community or connected via infrastructure through proxies. The complexity of the underlying infrastructure is not something that should be exposed to, to, to the users and the community itself. And apart from policies, the same goes for attributes, access rights, and all these things. So at the moment, basically, a group of people has been granted access to a resource. They should be able to access it without taking care of how things could be mapped across resource providers, etc. So uh, this is the high level view uh, of how we see things happening. We are not there yet. So right now there are many steps that uh, are still manual in this process, especially when we integrate resources from um, uh, uh, external resource providers. But we're working towards this direction to make this integration seamless. And back to you now, Nicolas. Thank you, Christo. There's also a question in the chat from Raymond about the, the how to, to, to manage the, uh, the access rights in a, in a VO. Uh, Raymond, there is a slide describing the, so the next slides are about authorization. So uh, after we finish with those slides and you still uh, have a question, uh, we can discuss it if that's okay with you. Super, so uh, authorization. Basically, we can distinguish two uh, main types of, other, of authorization information. The first one is the user attributes, meaning group and role information, assurance, uh, affiliation of the researcher within their home organization or, or uh, the community. And then there are capabilities. It's defined uh, the, the resources that a, a user is allowed to, to access. And this also means defining specific actions that the user is allowed to perform on, on a resource. And capabilities uh, essentially allow to uh, expose authorization information in a compact way. Go to the next slide, please. Now, uh, having said this, so we have this distinction, but this doesn't mean that both capability-based and user-based authorization cannot coexist. So, Let's take a commercial service application as an example. So you are all familiar working with, with Google Talks. So when you share uh, a, a document and allow anyone with a link to access, this is essentially you're giving this a, a capability. While where you're sharing, uh, but you can still share the, the document with specific uh, people based on their uh, email address. So uh, this is uh, an example of, of user admin based uh, of authorization. So having these diff two different models does mean that they cannot be uh, combined. Next slide, please. Now let's see some uh, examples of what we mean with each type of uh, attribute. So group and role information. Uh, the user is a member of, uh, of group X, or uh, we, we, we could say, we, there's also the uh, uh, to, to express that the user is a member uh, of a given uh, group, with a, with a specific role, for example, manager. Uh, assurance information. Uh, this includes information, for example, that the, the user's identifier is never reassigned, uh, globally unique and persistent. Or uh, we know the, the name of the user after uh, following a face-to-face -face ID vetting process. Or that the affiliation for information that we get from the user's home organization can be uh, uh, is, is updated at most uh, in a day or a month, uh, depending on the home organization uh, practices. And then for the affiliation, for example, uh, someone is a member of the faculty at uh, uh, University X, or that the, the user is a member of, of a community. Uh, next slide, capabilities. So with capabilities, uh, we express things like the user can access a resource named 
example resource that work, or that the, that the user in a more complex uh, in a more advanced scenario that the user is allowed to uh, perform uh, create and, and delete uh, on the on storage uh, resource which is under a resource called VM dashboard. Next slide, please. So let's take uh, some of this information into and, and, and get into more details. So for VO group uh, membership and all information uh, for which uh, there is no uh, uh, standard way of doing this uh, uh, in Open ID Connector or OAuth 2. We have the guidelines specification from ARC, which uh, standardizes how to express this information and most importantly, how to exchange it in an interoperable way across different infrastructures. So based on these uh, guidelines followed by the Airscape AI, we have the Edu-Person Entitlement Attribute in the case of SAML, or the Edu-Person Entitlement Claim in the case of Open ID Connect, where we, uh, which we use to encapsulate this information. And this group membership uh, follows this role syntax that you, that you see here. So essentially we encode the name of the group or there could also be a hierarchy of groups. Optionally, if uh, the, the access model requires users to, 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 to have uh, specific roles and uh, giving them different access rights. Uh, there is also the possibility to encode role information in that attribute. And then there is also this part, the group authority part that identifies uh, the source of this uh, group information where, uh, where it is being uh, managed. In the next slide, you can see some more realistic examples of how this uh, group membership and role information uh, attributes look like in practice. So in the first example, we have um, uh, the, the, a basic example where uh, uh, this uh, type of information encodes the membership of a user in a VO called VO example. In the other exam, in, in, the, in the second example, uh, we have uh, a group hierarchy. So there is uh, the the VO, then there is a parent group, and then there is a subgroup or, or a child group. Now, if there is also role information uh, for that user uh, who is member in, 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 in a group, there is also uh, this component that allows to encode the role information of the user. If you go to the next slide. So regarding affiliation information, uh, as we mentioned before, we have two basic types of affiliation. We have the affiliation of the researcher with their home organization. Remember the example, faculty at University X, or the affiliation within a community. So again, uh, we have uh, a guideline specification document uh, from ARC that standardizes how to express these two different types of affiliation. Uh, particularly in cross infrastructure scenarios. So in, in summary, there is the VO person external affiliation attribute, uh, which is intended to convey the affiliation with the user's home organization. And then uh, there's the person scoped affiliation for expressing the affiliation within the community. And similarly in OpenID Connect, we have uh, 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 claims uh, specifically for these two types of affiliation. And what is interesting here is to see the flow of this information from the researcher's home organization through the community AI up to the end service that they're trying to access. So we have the, uh, the affiliation within the home organization, which comes from the institutional home organization. Uh, and then we have the community AI, that re-encodes this information in the view of personal external affiliation attribute. And then the, the community AI is also able to assert the, the researcher's membership in a given community. So you can see here an important part of the an important role of the community AI, which is to enrich the, the researcher's profile with the community uh, attributes. Uh, so now we, we know that the user is, is a faculty at the home organization and also that they are part of this example community.org community. And then this information can pass through the infrastructure proxy 
and end up in the in the service where that the user is trying to, to access. If you go to the next slide, thank you. So capabilities. Uh, so uh, again, uh, to standardize the way that we express capabilities, we adopt the guideline specification document coming from the ARC community, called uh, G027, uh, which defines how to, uh, which attributes to, to use to convey this information and how this should be encoded. So again, we have the Edupression Entitlement attribute used in the case of, of a SAML service. And then there is the Edupression Entitlement claim in the case of Open and Connect uh, Reliant Parties. Again, uh, we have a URN based syntax. Uh, now, instead of the reserved uh, word group, there is the, this uh, RIS uh, uh, literal, which denotes uh, an entitlement conveying capability information. Then there is, of course, uh, uh, this part which identifies a given resource. And then, in, 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 uh, in scenarios where there are hierarchies of resources, there is also the ability to specify one or more uh, child resources. And then, uh, if more fine grain control is needed, there is also the possibility to encode specific action, uh, actions. And as with the group specification, there is also uh, the, this component that identifies the source of the information. And in this example, you can see how a capability is encoded uh, in a more re realistic scenario. Uh, there is the, the, the parent resource identified here. This is the, a sub resource, a child resource. And then in this example, we also include specific uh, actions that the, 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 the user is, is able to perform on the identified uh, uh, resources. Next slide, please. Now, how this information can be can be used to actually uh, manage access? There are three let's, uh, three main models. So there is the, the the first one is the centralized policy information point. The second one is centralized policy management and decision making, and the third one also adds enforcement. Let's go uh, to uh, uh, and see one by one how each of these authorization models work. So if you go to the, to the, to the next slide, this is the, this, the, uh, the simplest authorization uh, model. In this scenario, we have a user that accesses a service and the, the, the user is redirected to, to, to the proxy, to the IDP, they authenticate. So the, uh, the, the information from the home organization reaches the proxy, the yellow box here. Then, as we mentioned before, the, this uh, identity is enriched with the community managed attributes. So the proxy uh, in this centralized policy information point model is responsible for uh, aggregating all the relevant authorization information for the user. For example, the, the groups, the roles, uh, the affiliation with the community. And then all this information is being sent to the, uh, it's been released to the end service, which is responsible for processing this uh, uh, information and then making an authorization decision and enforcing it. So in this model, uh, uh, the, the, the community AI acts as an aggregator of the, of the authorization information and it is the end service that processes this information, takes the decision and enforces it. Let's go to the next model, the next slide, uh, where the, 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 the community is also responsible for the decision-making process. Typically, this means that after the proxy aggregates all the, the authorization information, for example, the, the, the groups of the user and their roles, instead of giving this information to the end service and then expecting the end service to take a decision, it is the proxy uh, that processes this group information and in the end produces, generates capabilities that are sent to the end service. And of course, this model simplifies the, the end service's life because then the, the, the service or, uh, 
is only responsible for enforcing the capabilities that are sent by the by the community AI. Of course, having said this, on the other hand, it means uh, less control for the end service. So, depending on the end services requirements, they can go for either the the first model, where the proxy is just an aggregator for the rest of information, or if they want a simpler approach and, and they want to delegate the decision making process to the community AI, they can go for the capability based approach. And now the third model, if you go to the next slide, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, in practice, it's, it's not a, a, a different uh, model, it's, it's more of can be seen as an extension to the previous two models. So in, in this model, we have a proxy aggregating authorization information about the user. Um, we have, um, uh, and, and then based on this information or after uh, generate the capabilities, the proxy can also enforce a decision. So uh, it can completely block the access. So, and this is more relevant in a, in a scenario uh, where there is uh, uh, a security incident, so uh, uh, a, a given user or a VO is, uh, needs to be blocked. So with this model, it allows the community AI to centrally uh, suspend access uh, to, to services for, for, uh, for a given user. And again, this, in, in, in this model, we uh, simplify the, the life of the end services because uh, the, the community AI can enforce the, the access uh, decision. Next slide. So after having uh, gone through all the, uh, the, the, the details for the authorization information, uh, Raymond, do you want to, to have we answered your question? Do you want to? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, in in this uh, 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 next slides, we have some examples of how this uh, works in practice. So, uh, uh, we've chosen a, a, a examples where users uh, access uh, infrastructure services through their community AI, and this in this first example. You can see how a user, Andrea, you can already start the, the, the video. So you can see a user accessing EGI notebooks, the EGI notebooks service. Uh, after the, the user selects to, to sign in, uh, they're being redirected to their infrastructure proxy, in this case, EGI check in. Then they select their community AI, in this case, it's Edu Teams. The user identifies their home organization, they provide their credentials, they log in, they redirect back to the community AI service, they, they see the information released by the community AI service, then they, they are being redirected back to the proxy, and, last, and lastly, they are able to access uh, the service with the community information, uh, uh, with their community uh, managed authorization attributes. Uh, the next uh, uh, example uh, is similar. So uh, again, we have uh, a service uh, accessing uh, being accessed through a community AI. In this use case, in, in this example, it is the HGI application database. The user has been directed to check in. They choose Elixir AI as their community AI, and then. As, uh, the user selects their organization. In this, uh, for example, it's, it's Google. They go back to the community AI, to the infrastructure proxy, and they end up at the end service with their community profile. So I see that there is a, a, a question in the chat. Uh, which authorization model do you recommend in case of community comprised different services that come from, from different research domains? Um, I think um, in order to be, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, this depends greatly on the, on the types of, of, of services. So uh, I, ideally, uh, uh, a community AI uh, should support all the three models. Again, if the, the goal is to make the end services life easier, 
then capabilities is the, the simplest approach because that means uh, less burden on, on the services. Uh, on the other hand, we, we don't have, uh, we, we haven't prepared the demo for this, but it is already possible to, uh, to, like, to, uh, to, 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 to use federated access for command line access. And this is one of the, uh, so in, in the upcoming training webinars where we will show how each community AI service uh, works. Uh, we have already identified this command line access as one of the topics that uh, uh, should, be, should be covered. So uh, you, will, you will be able to see more details of how this can work in the upcoming trainings. Uh, yes. So yes, uh, uh, there is a question about uh, uh, about the SDK. So for 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 checking, uh, there is no uh, JavaScript SDK available now. Uh, there is a, yeah. As as Raymond says in the chat. Uh, one uh, one way to support this uh, SSH access is through uh, SSH keys that can be uh, exposed through LDAP. If you go to the next slide, Andrea. Yeah, so we're now at the, the, the questions and answers. So please, uh, you either use the, the chat or Slido. Uh, or raise your hand and we can... Nicholas, we have also a question in uh, Slido. Slido. Can you, perhaps, uh, Pavel, can you share your screen with uh, with Slido? Or can you try that? Oh, ah. so I have to... Ah, Andrea, there is also a link to, to Slido. If you go to the next slide, let's see if you can share this. So this is, yeah. It is the personal training for communities, the last room in the list. The last. Okay, th this is the, the poll where we have identified some topics for the upcoming uh, trainings. So please uh, uh, vote here. The questions on the left, um, yeah. uh, I mean, the, the questions are near the pools and the blue line, uh, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, I think I can unmute. Uh, can someone unmute Hannah? Okay, let me just do that. Uh, yeah, okay, she's Thank unmuted. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm wondering about situations where we have a service that's behind an infrastructure proxy A that wants to use OAuth delegation to push some data into a service that's behind a different proxy, which may or may not have a common community proxy at the top of the chain. Um, is this something that's been considered? Yes, yes. It's uh, actually there is a, an interim solution uh, where we, we uh, which is based on extending the oath to introspection endpoint essentially uh, with this interim solution. Uh, and there are already some uh, implementations uh, that support this extension of the introspection endpoint. Essentially, you have the introspection endpoint being able to, um, to to forward the introspection request to the other infrastructure proxy, so that the end service doesn't need to connect to multiple proxies. So, the the, the one way to deal with this situation is to uh, uh, is for the service to connect to all the proxies. Which of course it's not the, the ideal solution, but the service can only do that. So in this interim solution, the service can use the introspection, uh, which will then uh, uh, forward the request to the other infrastructure and then uh, return the uh, the, val the validity status of the token to 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 the service. But the long-term solution uh, should be the OpenID Connect Federation which will essentially allow services to connect to multiple infrastructures in, in, in a scalable way. 
Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, are there any other? No, that's the only question. Uh, ah, there's this comment from Raymond. Who decides how, when AI systems can be coupled and unstuck? Also, what does that mean? Okay, uh, so this uh, this stacking or, or, or chaining. So, uh, if there is a community, you know, perhaps uh, Andrea, can you go can you go back to the presentation with the with the EOS Hub AI architecture in the beginning? Okay, so let so uh, let's take the, the second example where we had Elixir uh, members of the Elixir community accessing EGI services. So this uh, in, in this example we have the infrastructure proxy EGI check-in, and then there is the Elixir AI acting as a community uh, AI. Now, technically, this means that this uh, 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 the Elixir AI and the infrastructure proxy EDIG key need to exchange metadata. So effectively, the Elixir AI is connected as an identity provider to the infrastructure proxy. So technically, this is how uh, uh, this uh, 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 integration takes place. Of course, there is uh, 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 the part that Christos uh, uh, described where there is this uh, 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 the process where the community manager will ask uh, resources, for example, by going through the EOS marketplace. So it is not just establishing the, te the technical trust, it's also uh, uh, allocating resources to a given uh, VO or community. If I can add something, it's, it's probably the point is that uh, typically communities choose their um, solution to manage uh, the solution that best fits the, the requirements to manage their own community. But here is provided a, an interoperability framework to put things together so that uh, uh, it's possible to, to define trust relationship between uh, communities and infrastructures and there are the technical means to achieve uh, interoperability uh, at the attribute level so that the uh, information authentication and authorization information can be exchanged across the various levels and understood by services without requiring changes to the code of the services Uh, Nicholas, I guess Peter has a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, what I'm actually wondering a little bit is um, when we are uh, in a scenario where we would like to use procedures, uh, automatic, automated, which behind which there is not they are directly a person, and which is uh, still. Uh, would like to use the um, authentication system to access uh, restricted, for example, resources or something like this. How would this work? I mean, this would, uh, I'm, I think this is what in the old style uh, X509 uh, was, was were the robot certificates and mm -hmm. how this is translated into the new token uh, architecture, I guess. I could imagine something like a scenario that some uh, persons have the role or the capability to sign this robot uh, sort of uh, tokens, but where they would create it and how they will, would be removed, uh, renewed and things like this. Because usually oh. you won't have long-term persistence of this because you don't want to upload a token every day or something like this. So I can answer? Okay, oh. oh, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, great. So typically, the, the, there is a, so the, the, for rob, robot certificates in uh, in the grid history were typically bound to a specific application, and uh, 
And uh, so basically the idea was that the computation was, was done by a specific application or a group of applications. So in WCG context, the data management is done by, the, by a specific robot certificate typically. And um, so Auth and OpenID Connect provides uh, the concept of service accounts for this. So basically, and provides some flows that, uh, that uh, basically are the protocols that can be used to, to make sure that these service accounts basically always have a fresh token when they actually have to interact with the downstream service. So, um, so in a way, the, 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 the service account is a first class citizen in, in the new model. While in the former model, it was more of a, a trick. We had to invent a special kind of credential for, uh, for uh, which was the robot certificate to accommodate that. So uh, to, this is how we are looking at uh, enabling this kind of scenarios. So leveraging service accounts. And then uh, of course you can, uh, you can in, uh, this depends actually on the, on the proxy implementation, you can link attributes also to service accounts. Like, uh, like attributes that could convey particular privileges or, or something like this. Okay. Where this Regarding the, the long running computation and the ability of uh, getting fresh tokens, typically uh, there are also ways here to, 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 to make sure that uh, there are flows in place that allow uh, a, a system to have the ability to request a fresh token whenever they need to interact with the downstream service without requiring any intervention from an operator or authentication, explicit uh, authentication for an operator. Okay, this, this service uh, accounts live in the, or either in the community AAI or in the, on the multi-tenant AAI without having a link to EduGain and so on? Yeah, I would say that the service, I don't, well, I would say that mm, the service account is community specific. So I would say yeah. it lives in the community okay. AI. And whether it is a, a dedicated proxy instance or the community is served by a multi-tenant uh, instance doesn't really make a difference, I would say. Okay. Because even in a multi-tenant uh, uh, community AI, again, you know, there are, there are boundaries. So uh, the, 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 the service account will be bound to a given uh, VO shared by, shared by that multi-tenant uh, service. It will not be shared across all the VOs. Okay. Uh, is this correct? This is the next question from, from Hannah about uh, the user experience. So this is, uh, we, we have a lot of feedback uh, around this uh, double discovery. So what we are currently working on is the, the, the IDP hitting specification, which will allow uh, uh, services to provide hints about the identity provider that should be used. And effectively this will, will allow uh, the end services to signal uh, which uh, community AI, for example, should be used for authentication. So when the user goes from the end service to the infrastructure proxy, the discovery process will be uh, transparent because the, the service uh, can send a hint so that the proxy knows where to, to send the, the user. And uh, apart from this uh, uh, hinting, uh, signaling uh, support, uh, we are also looking into more advanced scenarios where it would be possible to send hints, for example, to, to uh, narrow down the list of identity providers. You might have a use case where it makes sense for a service to be accessed, for example, by only RNS and certified IDPs. So with this uh, hinting specification, uh, um, there is support for signaling only so RNS the discovery or blacklist uh, uh, a given entity uh, attribute cat uh, uh, entity category, or so only this subset of uh, uh, IDP entity IDs. So uh, we, are, uh, we know that the user experience, the multi-discovery is, uh, is an issue. And with this IDP hitting specification, uh, hopefully we will make the, the login uh, flow 
uh, more straightforward for, for end users. Okay, thanks. And then the next question. No, I think we already covered the non-interactive, non-personal non access, yes. How do you see the relation of communities and generic services as Zenodo? And mute also uh, Jose or uh, just to, to pronounce the question. Huh. Or not. Yeah, I, don't, I was trying to unmute as well. Um, yeah, I mean, just based on this, in this uh, diagram you have in there. So I, I'm thinking of Synodal, we would integrate with EOS AI. And, um, and I was listening to the whole presentation about communities. Uh, so I was not very sure how this fits into, into a service like Synodal, which is generic and is not targeting a specific community. So uh, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know, it was a, a generic question, right? Because in another slide, and maybe it's the next one, you have an arrow that goes directly to the generic service. I don't remember which uh, which number. So, so yeah. perhaps Nicolas, I can take this. Um, uh, this goes back to what I was presenting as where we want to go towards. Um, right now, it is true that um, if a service wants to connect one of the community AIs, they have to do this, this direct connection to each community AI directly, which is uh, at best suboptimal. Uh, but this is where we are right now. What we're working to go towards is um, the notion where uh, services like Zenodo will be able to connect once the EOSC AI and, and be made available potentially to all community AIs that are part of EOSC. Okay. Uh, and, and we're going towards this direction with uh, by embracing the concept of, of a federation, of a EOSC federation, where basically services will be able to join and then be made available to all the other participating uh, entities within, uh, within EOSC. There is an interesting question uh, in um, uh, Slido about uh, vision uh, on AI in the next uh, 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I think for the next year, 30 years, the answer is simple. We should not be talking about it. Yeah. Well, but I think that there is an aspect in this question that is very relevant, which is the sustainability. And uh, one part of um, one interesting thing that can be said about sustainability is that by relying on, uh, on, uh, on standards and technologies that are uh, used also outside of our context, basically we are reducing the risk on our side, basically, because if we, uh, as it as it was done in the past, if we develop our own specific, very specific and very tailored tools that basically work only in academia, then we are exposed to the, all the, the full cost of uh, maintaining these tools and uh, uh, ensuring that they are sustainable. While uh, if we take a different approach where we, we try to embrace as much as possible existing technologies that are also used outside of our context, we reduce the risk of actually being the only uh, communities in charge of maintaining and having to uh, support the sustainability of the services that we put in place. For sure, uh, I think that also EOSC is, uh, will be a sustainability channel for the central services so that uh, uh, as soon as uh, uh, the various proxies will, 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 will be a, a key asset, a key component in the infrastructure, computing infrastructure for uh, research communities, the EOSC should act as a, as a sustainability channel. So speaking, this actually a sustainability problem is, uh, doesn't, doesn't need 30 years to surface. I mean, you, 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 could, <laughs> you typically see problems much earlier. I, we have seen uh, such problems in WCG even after uh, 
10 years or 15 years of components that were uh, that were uh, discontinued and uh, and that forced us to start the migration to more standard technology in order to do not have uh, the full cost of uh, the sustainability on our shoulders. Exactly, Andrea. And let me add also to this one aspect is actually uh, going towards uh, standards and market standards. Uh, I have to say here a parenthesis that I think the academic and research community has been a pioneer in this field. So when things started happening like 20 years ago, there was nothing like that in the commercial world. So uh, there were many things happening at the time that were really pioneering this whole area of trust and identity. Now we see that the whole ecosystem matures. We see standards coming up, not only from the commercial world, from, but from a combination of the commercial world and the research communities and with all this experience. And we see commercial offerings. They're not here yet to support these kind of use cases, but I think in the years to come, we will be able to we'll see things like that happening. But one of the, I think, very important uh, drifts that we have seen during the last decade is going away from the notion that I have to run my own service operated by myself at my basement and actually start relying on receiving components like this as a service, infrastructure as a service, AI as a service, and relying basically on the commoditization of, of these components. So I think this is where we're heading also with AI. It becomes more a commodity of a commodity day after day. Uh, we have already now service providers providing solutions. We have more of them in the future. Um, so I think we're towards the right direction. And there's kind of a related issue of if you have an infrastructure that is meant to last 30 years, how do you identify users over a lifespan of 30 years? And that's a, actually a very hard problem if you are archiving data now, for example, that users need to be able to access 30 years from now. There's not very much that survives 30 years except perhaps biometrics. So it's kind of a hard problem, but if the AI is sustainable, then at, at least in theory, you can daisy chain identifiers for users throughout that time and ensure that they still have access to their stuff in 30 years from now. I guess the only way is to, to, to keep it sustainable is to, as um, Andrea said, is to leverage the technology and uh, just follow the, the, the uh, development. And we cannot imagine how uh, technology will look like in 30 years. Nicholas, uh, so did you um, ask to, to vote? Because I see some votes in the pool, but uh, not so many okay, so okay, far. I guess. So, uh, yes. So the, the idea, as, as mentioned before, was uh, that to organize some uh, uh, dedicated uh, webinars for the specific uh, services that are part of the Oscar BI. So this was meant to be of an introductory uh, training of the, the concept of the VO, the community AI, how, what are the different models for authorization for managing access. While we now want to go into more details and, uh, and there it makes sense to, to, to show how each service can be leveraged to, to uh, support these use cases. And for this, we have a poll uh, in Slido where we have identified some topics because there are a lot of things that, we, 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 uh, that needs to be covered. So please help us with your vote so that we know how to prioritize uh, what will be included in the upcoming uh, webinars. Yes, Nicholas, we can we can bring it on the on the screen the the, the results uh, also. I don't know who can share it. I can also try. I think and, and Andrea before yeah. And uh, no, yeah. I think uh, uh, it's Rob can do that or I can try. Ah. Ah, to, so to show it in regular, the regular users don't, don't see the results. Yes. So, Oh, okay. um, I can try to do that. Let me see. Okay. Uh, what did you want to show specifically? The, the, the results of the of the poll. Okay. I think I did it already. Ah, yeah. That's do you see it? Yes. 
So this is the current results. And uh, perhaps, yes, so please uh, vote here uh, or uh, suggest uh, additional topics because we, we might have missed something. So it, it seems that the, the most popular topic is the integrating services uh, in EOSC. But we can still do more than one, right? So we just know how to prioritize them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So any other topics that someone would like to, to, to suggest, you can also raise your hand and, and discuss. I'll put it in the chart. Have, have we uh, uh, gone through all the questions from the chat? all of the questions. So if, if uh, perhaps before we, we wrap up again to, to mention that at the end of the, of the slides that will be linked from the, from the public agenda of the event, there are uh, an addition, I think, uh, another 50 slides or so that go into more details into uh, the policy aspect because this is uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the policy requirements is a key aspect when setting up a, a, a VO. And there are also more details on, the, on how to set up a VO, the, the required roles, and many aspects that. Of course, we, we, we couldn't go through, through in this training, uh, during this training. So uh, please uh, uh, have a look at the, this uh, uh, supplementary uh, material and give us your, your, your feedback. Okay, I think we can conclude from already from the results that uh, still um, um, the most uh, missing part of uh, uh, documentation probably is uh, the practical uh, pr procedures, practical instructions, uh, how to integrate the, the service. And this is a uh, um, quite important uh, topic to, to cover among others. Also, in the presentation, you can also find links to the uh, documentation where there's, uh, uh, we have documentation for how to integrate services with the different uh, uh, services. Uh, there are also uh, links for documentation uh, for end users, for community managers. So please uh, uh, go to the, the wiki where you can find uh, det detailed information for each tool. And there is also a link to the roadmap where it uh, identif identifies uh, some of the current gaps. For example, uh, the user experience with the multi-discovery that was mentioned by, uh, by Hannah or the, or the delegation uh, when you have services uh, connected to different infrastructure proxies. So uh, these gaps are uh, uh, described in our roadmap page where there's also information of, on when we expect uh, to have uh, implementation of, uh, of, of a solution for each of these gaps. Okay. Uh, we we finished five minutes before, <laughs> which was 
I, I didn't expect that to be honest. I thought that uh, one and a half hours would not be enough. This never happened. <laughs> yeah, AI session. So this is unprecedented. <laughs> this is a first, that's for sure. So we have to understand what was the problem. <laughs> 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 uh, people not able to talk. <laughs> we should unmute everyone. That's what I did. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think we can wrap up. Thank you very much, everyone. Welcome to Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to the people who asked questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent session. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for attending. <laughs>